I'm watching your body language as you're telling your story. I get two sides here. I see a, a side, if I didn't know you and I met you for the first time, and I saw you at a restaurant, I'd say this guy's a gentle, sweet, you know, uh, uh, the way you talk, calm, all that stuff, right, on the way you speak. I don't know if you guys get that feeling. That's the feeling I get. I get yes. a very sweet, gentle side, right? How, how are you hiding that rage inside? How, how did you do that? Because there's no way in the flipping world that you are going to be able to live that kind of a life, have that kind of trauma, have that kind of animosity on what was done where nobody can describe that to you. This is your life. This is not a movie. This is not a book. This is not an article we're reading. How are you managing that rage? Because the same way as you're gentle, on the other side, special ops, I know what it is. You know, special ops, I hung out with those guys. You know, whether it was Delta, I was about to become 18, 18 uh, Delta with 5th nice. Group at Fort Campbell, nice. Kentucky. Nice. I went and interviewed a lot of guys like you, and I said, I'm going to go a different direction. I got out of the military. How do you manage that gentle side and the rage side? You know, Patrick, I'm going to put you in my worst day. You know, it's through the struggles, right? When I said, no, I'm going to put you through this day. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was eight years old. And people always ask me, too, what's your first memories of America? I'll tell you. My mother took me to a grocery store, and she, she bought all this food. And, and look, that, that don't mean anything to you guys, but I'm telling you, when you starve and you're in refugee camps for a year and a half, that means everything. And then she was so happy, and she took, she took me out. It was Mother and Sunday, you know? We were loading the groceries into the car, and this man came up to me, and he spit in my face, and he flicked my mom off, and he told me to go home. He called me chink. This is in America. Eight years old, Carolina. That was my first memories of America. Unpopular Vietnam War, and I was the image of an unpopular Vietnam oh, War. Wow. And when I was eight, <clears throat> I went to uh, school. It was very poor. I had holes all in my clothes. You know, we, uh, we lived in a poor part of town. I was reminded how poor I was every day. And uh, we went in school. It was substitute teacher day. And uh, my name is pronounced in Vietnamese, right? But I say two lamb, so you guys don't mess up my Vietnamese name. So um, it was sub two teacher day. He called my name, and obviously he said it wrong, and everybody made fun of me. Everybody's and throwing papers at me. Mm -hmm. Remind me how poor I was. And there was this bully. He, he made fun of me, made slanted eyes, and we, we both got in trouble, right? I don't know how I got in trouble, but I got in trouble. I know he went down to the principal's office, and the principal sat us down. He told me, our parents need to come pick us up. My mom didn't drive it at the time, so I knew I was going to be there for a while. And then the bully's mother came in first, and uh, she demanded to know what's wrong. The principal stood up, and he looked over, and he goes, your son caught that boy right there, a chink. I sat back down. The mother went in the corner. She picked up her son, walked over to me, and, and you know how somebody stands there, you have to look up? Because mm -hmm. I was looking at the ground. I was ready to feed it. I looked up, and she said, my son is right. You don't belong here. Ooh. And you need to go back home to your country. You're eight years old. Well, then, I cried so hard. I hyperventilated. And the principal said, boy, you're going to cry like that. You need to go in the hall. And that night I came home. I didn't even talk to my mom. I was so upset. And my mother came in. I didn't even eat dinner. She came in. She sat down next to me. She said, son, there will be the bad days. But what do you learn from it? Never asked me what everything that happened or anything's wrong. I knew at that point that I got tired of being this hu weak human being. You know, I was escaped from war. I found, you know, I faced death. I faced, you know, refugee camps. And I got tired of being this weak human being. So I made a promise to myself that day that I was going to be stronger than hate. But what's that even look like, right? Mm -hmm. So what, 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 what you see in me, Patrick, is I have rage. It's there and I can switch it on and off at any second. But it's like a weapon, it's, I can safety that gun, right? Because I drive, as a warrior, I drive off of compassion. So, so let's, let's go through this, okay? Uh, when, you, when you said that, I'm trying to see how that trauma affected me. I'm a kid, I come to the States. Uh, when I came here was seventh grade, so whatever seventh grade is, I'm 12 years old and I'm coming here. And my English sucked, so for me, they would, uh, I had a hard time pronouncing uh, Government, I would say government. I had a hard time pronouncing Wednesday. I would say Wednesday. 
because of that uh, end that's there, it really screws the whole thing up. Mm-hmm. Whoever came up with that name, they need to be fired as of, <laughs> yeah. you know, right now. Uh, there was a show called Gilligan's Island. Yeah. I would say Gilligan's Island because that S is there. Why the hell would you put an S there? What's yeah. the problem with these guys here, right? I'm sure you struggled with lasagna. Lasagna. <laughs> that was easy because my mother made lasagna. <laughs> but fresh off the boat, you know, hey, you're fresh, you're phob, you're fresh off the boat. I'm like, I'm going to buy the damn boat one day. You guys are pissing <laughs> me off, right? But that rage was either going into humor to lighten the load because mm-hmm. you have to be like, hey, funny, all this other stuff. You know, it's the humor side to kind of calm you down a lot of times. Comedians have lived a very difficult life. What did you do with it? Like, did you put it in martial arts? Did you put it at 13, 14 years old in sports? Did you put it in fighting kids? Like, were you the guy? We had a guy in school. His name was Andy, Asian guy. And uh, uh, this guy would walk so calm. One time a guy called him something. I mean, a good friend of mine. He didn't just beat the guy. He almost killed the guy. We had to pick him up. We couldn't even pick this guy up. He was, like, going to kill this kid if we didn't stop him. The, I, and he went from a calm, sweet kid to a guy capable of killing somebody, where did you release your tension and anger into? What was that for you as a young teenager? You know, I I, um, I, I was raised, my stepfather was uh, Special Forces, my uncle was Special Forces, so I was raised in Fayetteville outside Fort Bragg, the biggest special operations yeah, base. second. Right, yep. more commandos walked there than, yep. than anywhere in the United States, so I was raised around that. But when, when you asked me what my outlet was, you know, Patrick, I was beaten. I was bullied my whole, my whole, all the way to high school. Um, my outlet was, um, you know, my spending time with my father, the special forces, but I knew, let me bring you to this day. So I, I was being picked on, was spit on, clothes, you know, being ripped off me, just remind how poor I was. And my uncle, special forces, American special, he was the one who funded our paperwork to get us to the United States. American Special Forces, he was an officer, his G base got overran Vietnam, he got stabbed by SKS, evac'd out. This guy's, he's an amazing American. And my uncle picked me up, right? And he, he drove me in. He must have sensed something was wrong with me that day because he, he said something just out of blue. He said, you know, too, there'll be days that people are going to spit on you and they're going to judge, they're going to flick you off and they're going to say, you don't belong here. You need to ask yourself. Do you want to be a fucking commando today? You know, when your bones ache and you found all your injuries and you, you just want to quit on life, you need to ask yourself, do you want to be a fucking commando today? When it's cold outside, it's raining, and you know the right thing to do is to get up and exercise your body because you're this weapon that America needs. You need to ask yourself, do you want to be a fucking mindset. commando today? God, I love that. And I was 11. Can you imagine the impact that meant? Commando a life of discipline when I'm so weak and being picked on. See, I, I don't think you were weak, though, because it would have broken a lot of people. You, yeah, weren't, I agree. you weren't weak. You were just, you didn't know how to take control no. yet. You didn't know how to set boundaries. You didn't, you were, you were not weak. And not, not to disagree with yeah. your life story, forgive me, but, you know, that would have broken a lot, a lot, a lot of people, man. And, you know, Jordan Peterson has a great saying that, only the violent are capable of peace because if you're not capable of violence you're incapable of peace you're obedient you're subservient only people capable of violence can choose to be peaceful you know everybody else it's not your choice so i mean in in that regard it sounds like you know the light went off where you were like i need to become capable of violence in order to gain the respect i need and then you know, scale it back from there and know when to use it and when not to use the, it. The um, the light went off when a, a year after my father left me, my biological father left me, and I haven't heard from him. And I was being spit on, picked on. I was um, now indoctrinated into a very strict military upbringing because my stepfather was a drill sergeant in special forces. It's four thirty in the morning. I would raise the flag, put the hand over my heart. I would do physical training before I even start uh, um, school dress code. I was, what I'm saying is I had a hard time with the discipline. And my mother came to me with this box. And she said, you know, son, this, this is from your father. And, you know, and I, I, I sat the box across the room because I, I was so disappointed in my father because I, I didn't hear from him. So finally, I had the courage to open up this box. And I opened up the box and inside this box was four contents. It was these VHS tapes that were dubbed 
right? And uh, I ram and they were written in Vietnamese. I, I didn't know what you know how to read Vietnamese. I, I just randomly picked up the tape. I threw it in the uh, VCR. It was the art of Budo. If you don't know what that means, it's the martial arts side being samurai. The way, Bushido. You know, I was uh, very defeated at that moment, and then this this image of samurai, this image of a, a, a higher mobile way, uh, moral way of living, a moral values, to, to dedicate your life to being a warrior, to, to help others, compassion. You know, that's the Bushido code, right? So if you ask me, Patrick, that was my escape, education. Bushido, a warrior's uh, upbringing. We, uh, in the samurai culture, they call Bushi, the study of being a warrior, samurai. So at 16, you know, I, I, I tried out for, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the intensive training, the physical training that I know I needed for special ops. And at 18, it was no direct hire into special forces back then. So I went to the uh, 82nd paratroopers. I went to the long range reconnaissance, uh, uh, amphibious reconnaissance teams. And then I made to special forces at 21. Uh, two, were you, uh, what was the first fight you ever got into? Like where you beat somebody up, how old were you in the first first fight you got into? Oh, I was beaten almost every day in, um, in uh, elementary school and in junior high. I wouldn't say it was uh, more me fighting, it was them beating me. When did that stop? When was the first time where they said, you know what, I just, probably not a good idea to mess with two anymore, man, this guy. I remember that uh, I started studying martial arts when I was eight, more of the uh, discipline. My stepfather was, uh, he taught me the Green Beret side of combatives, you know, special forces, hand-to-hand -hand combat. So there was this bully, he picked on me, uh, and I smashed his nose in, you know. Unfortunately, he shattered his whole nose. Um, Eight years old? No, I was think I was uh, 12 at that time. Okay. I had enough. So by middle school, you were ready to Yeah, I was that kid that, back. you know, when you go back, uh, when you're wall locker and you have posty stickers mm -hmm. like chink and go back home, like yeah. those were normal for me, right? And I got tired of it and I smashed it in this kid's face. Yeah. And, um, oh man. Um, I was in trouble, you know, not only in school, but at home because my father was teaching me these moves and here I am uh, employing them in a, um, mm -hmm. a very lethal way. Cause this, he, did this happen consistently or no? Were you, were you the guy that got into a lot of fights or no? No. Okay. You know, I, um, I believe in the martial arts. I believe in if we can not fight, don't fight. Got so it. here, here's the story of not fighting. So. My, my father didn't want me to fight, right? He said, you're not doing it. You're, you're going you're gonna to go to school. You're going to be this, this, you know, gifted kid, AP classes. You're going to do this, right? He told you not to fight back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because so many moves were killing moves. Because you knew the moves, but he said, didn't want you to yeah, use I mean, them, even for defense. Yeah, destroy these kids. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to I mean, the, the moves you. that we were taught is to... Uh, to blow out somebody's eardrums by cupping your hands, to put your fingers through somebody's eyes, to to, shash and to smash in their face and nose, to break their neck if we need to. Um, but these are moves that were taught to him in the Special Forces and moves that was given to me, but in a in a very secret manner. Yeah, right? this is not breaking balsa wood to get your yellow belt type of stuff. Exactly. This is, yeah, this, this is, is true actual death Budo. art. Yeah. It's true the art of Budo, which is the combat side of being a warrior. So I knew all that, and I was being picked on as being, you know, but this this is where uh, strategy came into play because I was a student of ninjutsu and ninja samurai, and, and I was studying. When I say a student, I would study, right? The, the history and the arts, and, and the ninjas are always about what? about outsmarting your opponent, right? Because they were employees as spies, right? Reconnaissance. So uh, I, I realized that and I knew the bully schedule. So I would write down his timeline, his schedule, and I would look <laughs> at his pattern of life. And then I knew his pattern of life and his, his schedule. So I avoid his pattern of life and his schedule. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you want to see the entire podcast, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.